gentlemen, welcome again to Secrets of Meaning, the podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, with these podcasts, we hope to explore some of the issues that touch us, our families, and our community in light of the revolution and longevity that is helping to reshape our Jewish world. Uh, you can listen to previous podcasts and connect with us on our homepage, jewishsacredaging.com. And if you want to contact me personally about the show or ideas, email me at rabbiaddress at jewishsacredaging.com. And it is with a great deal of pleasure uh, that we welcome back uh, an old friend to our Seekers of Meaning series, uh, the senior rabbi of Adif Emanuel in beautiful Mount Laurel, New Jersey, Rabbi Ben David. Hi, Ben. How, nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Good, good. I hope the family is well and everybody is safe and and, and well. Uh, thank you again for your time. Um, about a year ago, or maybe a little bit more a year ago, you, you, you joined us to talk about some of the emerging journeys of your own personal story with cancer as a, as a survivor, uh, and you're back to running, and, and, and congratulations on that. But I wanted to bring you on today um, because we're a little bit, of, just a few days away from the beginning again of Passover, and believe it or not, uh, Passover again, and after a year, we'll still be in pandemic mode for much of the United States of America, if not the world. And um, you've, you're a colleague who's done some thinking and writing about this, and I know some of your contributions to the CCR websites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I really wanted to pick your brain a little bit on now it's been a year, Passover is coming, it looks like, again, we're going to be doing Zoom seders for the most part. Um, how are you as a rabbi of a congregation um, beginning to work with your congregation on, on of this? My God, here we are a year later, and we're still in this. And thoughts? Right. Reactions? Right. Well, um, I think there's sort of a temptation to sort of go to that place that we're sort of still in this. Um which we are. I mean, clearly there are certain things that have not changed over, over the course of the year. Um, the, the fact that our world is for the most part shut down and kids are for the most part learning from home and that our synagogues to a great extent are shut down. Um, but in truth, we're in a much different place now than we were a year ago. Um, if we think of it like a, uh, a sort of a process of grieving or bereavement, uh, a year ago we were in a place of shock everything felt new, everything felt raw. Um, we were making decisions on the fly. Um, I, I know many of my colleagues were doing the same. Um, every minute having conversations, what do we do about services, religious school, and um, having to act very quickly on, on various fronts. Um, now we're fully settled into this reality and we're almost at home with this reality now. Um, so much so that standing on the bima and, and holding a service in front of 200 people would feel totally foreign uh, right now. Um, and it's going to take some getting used to when, God willing, we get back to that place. Um, so we're in a different place now. And uh, last year, you know, specifically when it comes to Passover, I think we were scrambling um, and trying to provide virtual content to our congregations. Um, I know for us at Adith Emmanuel, we didn't fully know how to pull off a sort of viable and um, substantive online Seder. So instead we had sort of a Seder night check-in where at a, at a given time, I think it was six o'clock, join our Zoom call and let's all say hello from our respective Seder tables. And it felt like the best we could do. Um, this year, and, and I think this goes with a lot of this, the stuff we're doing at the synagogue in general, we don't have that same sort of excuse, right? We can't say that we were caught off guard and unprepared. Um, we've had a full year to think through what should Passover look like? What should Purim look like? Um, what should Tu B'Shvat look like? And to now be really thoughtful with the virtual content. Um, so for instance, you know, as we sit here now recording this, um, our men's club is thinking about how to provide um, full Seder plates to our congregants who are unable to go out and go shopping. Um, all of that takes some coordinating and planning, how to do that safely, how to coordinate it. And we're thinking about what does a virtual Seder look like in a way that's going to be fun and um, interactive? How can we make use of our youth choir? Um, how can we make a virtual Seder 
um, something that feels appealing, right? Um, and, and not sort of a letdown when compared to the Seder that we're all used to when we're sitting around this big Seder table and we're all laughing and joking and sort of making all of the sort of same, you know, sort of the same customs and rituals that we've been doing for the last hundred years. Um, so we are talking about doing a virtual Seder and um, talking about how, how to get materials into people's hands. We're, all ta we're also talking about sort of the, the festival itself. You know, what is the, we, we traditionally hold a, a service the first morning. Uh, what does that look like? So um, I think we are in a, in, a, in a decidedly different place when it comes to sort of worship and, and planning versus last year. The metaphors and the symbolism of the Seder are very rich um, and constantly evolving, as everybody knows. <laughs> the, the major thematic metaphor or symbolism of, of our tradition is the wilderness experience, which obviously comes, right. comes to uh, play in the Seder. Could you just, you know, it, it would seem to me is, in, in thinking about this and preparing for this, um, it's almost like we've been in the wilderness for this year and we're yeah. looking like you, like you alluded to, we, we didn't know where we were a yeah. year ago. We're a little bit better now. How, how do you, how would you suggest or advise uh, the members of Adam Emanuel who want to say something about this symbolism? What, what would you? Yeah. I think there are certain aspects of the metaphor that work. I mean, I think the notion of wilderness is applicable. Um, as incidentally, it so often is in our lives, right? The notion of there is, we, we don't yet sort of see an end point. The focus is on the journey. Um, there's this sense that we might feel lost. Um, uh, there's a sense of nostalgia as the Israelites had even in the wilderness, you know, uh, even if what was familiar was um, decidedly um, difficult and, 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 and even abrasive, uh, it was what was familiar to them, you know, so they come to crave the land of Egypt. Uh, just like right now, all of a sudden we're craving, you know, having our errands to run and soccer practice to go to and school to go to. Um, we've sort of romanticized what was, uh, just like the Israelites uh, will, will, will have the tendency to do. Um, and I think sort of that sense of nostalgia is very much a Jewish idea. I mean, we are a nostalgic people right? We sort of look at the past through sort of rose colored glasses all the time. You know, what happened yesterday was decidedly greater, grander. And, and we do that with regard to our teachers and our rabbis. We do that with regard to our institutions, you know, and that we'll never fully recapture what was. And it's true. There is some, tr there's a lot of truth to that actually. Um, but we have this tendency of sort of elevating what was. So there's a lot of nostalgia that's going on these days. Um, and sort of the notion of the wilderness feels right. Uh, the Israelites didn't know when they get to the promised land. We don't know when COVID will come to an end uh, and what that end even looks like. Um, you know, I don't think there will be this sort of finite moment when all of a sudden COVID is quote unquote over. Um, I think we've sort of very gradually now begun to sort of sense an ending, but we're nowhere near sort of a, a, a place of widespread safety and health. Um, but I think that the metaphor is limited in that um, we we shouldn't sort of diminish the slavery of our ancestors, right? What they experienced was a dire level of, of hardship and oppression. Um, we are not oppressed. Uh, yes, we, we are limited. Uh, we're, we're not able to leave our homes as much. We're not able to go wandering around you know, uh, the mall, like our teenagers might want, you know, we camp doesn't look the same and we can't go to baseball games and stuff, but we're not oppressed. Um, um, I think there's some, some challenges and I think there's some, you know, uh, decidedly and rightfully so there's some frustration. Um, but I think we have to be careful about that sort of metaphor of, liberation that will be liberated as the Israelites were liberated from bondage. It's not the same. It's really not the same. So I, I've been treading carefully with that one. I've talked to a lot of our colleagues and I know I'm sure you have as well. Uh, th this year has significantly changed a lot of the ways colleagues function. 
not only because of the virtual services and stuff like that, but the whole nature of the interpersonal relationships that we prize and that really hold, in many cases, people together, uh, the relationship with the rabbi, um, pastoral counseling, those of us like you who have done funerals and shivas and viduis, it's just totally in such a different out-of-body experience in many ways. If I can, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I do. But what, how is this, how is this year changed your rabbinate and, and you, Rabbi Ben David, is a rabbi? Yeah. Well, I think there's, as always, there's two ways to look at it. On the one hand, we weren't prepared for any of this. Um, you know, a sort of virtual existence. Uh, HUC did not have a class in virtual worship, <laughs> virtual no, study. Didn't. <laughs> virtual, you know, pastoral care. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, of course, we were totally prepared for this because, you know, what, what the rabbi is at his or her best is, is, is present. And um, I think when it comes to sort of being an ally, being present for our congregants, um, this is precisely the moment we've always been prepared for. And I think for me, and maybe I speak for others too, this year has, in a lot of ways, sort of reduced my rabbinate to those things that are sort of the most essential and fundamental pieces of the rabbinate, right? It's all about pastoral care. It's all about outreach. It's all about sort of shepherding our people through hardship, right? I mean, I signed up to be a rabbi not because I wanted to go to a ton of meetings, right, and a and ton of emails. I signed up because that's the kind of stuff I wanted to be doing. Um, and that's and that's primarily what I'm doing now. Um, the frustration is that it is all happening virtually, and there's only so much that I can do with this. You know, um, counseling the bereaved or you know providing some guidance to a teen. It um, it doesn't have the same effect when it's happening over Zoom or, or FaceTime. It's it doesn't feel as genuine and substantive to me. You know, the, the, the irony is that the only way we have really of connecting with our people right now is via the same technology that all of us are sort of lamenting, right? That we're all on our screens and we're staring at Facebook and it's the stuff that we're most frustrated by all the time. That's also sort of our only real tool these days. Um, but in terms of how this, this time is changing me, um, I don't know. I think it's affirming a lot of the things that I already knew to be true. I think that, um, you know, to be a, a sort of a, a, a presence that is predicated on calm and on heritage and on, um, on a level of listening um, feels to me as it, as it really has always felt just uh, extraordinarily important. Um, to hear our people's anxiety, to hear their tension, to help them through it, um, and to rely on our tradition to help them through it. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's validated a lot of what I've already known to be true. Has there been a spiritual challenge to you in this? As you know, in, in going through is exactly what you're talking about, and having to do everything virtually, electronically, and not having yeah that powerful human connection. Have there been moments when you say, you know, my own belief system is changing or I'm being challenged spiritually for this? I think it is harder to connect spiritually over Zoom. I think Zoom and FaceTime and all of it sort of lends itself to kind of lighter expression. You know, there's sort of this kitschy aspect of it. You know, it always feels kind of we're off balance and we want to sort of, you know, poke fun at the situation. But I think going to a deeper place is hard uh, virtually. I found that certainly during the high holidays when I was sort of pouring out my soul, you yeah. know, think of, think of Colt Vitre, think of, think of Yisker and you're sort of up there. I, we were in the sanctuary, the cancer and I on our own, essentially, you know, pouring our very soul out just hoping that there's someone on the other end who's maybe connecting, maybe hearing us, you know, that maybe it's having an impact. We, but we didn't know. I mean, after the fact, they told us, yes. But um, I think 
in an age of Zoom for clergy, there's a lot of give and there's very little return, right? You're sort of sometimes feeding off of the congregation. You know they're hearing you. You know, they're crying at the right moment. They're laughing at the right moment. But over Zoom, that's really, really hard. Um, you don't know if your words are hitting. Yeah, it, I, I, we've all had similar experiences. And I, I, when this is over, as I've said to many of our colleagues, we're all going to have a book of Zoom stories. Of when you're teaching a class or trying to make this very important, powerful, spiritual, and you look at the, you look at the little boxes, and some people are looking directly at you, and you have them, and some people are eating lunch, and some people are on their phone, checking their email or playing with the dog. I mean, it it or other things which we could, we don't have to discuss, and we've all had this right. experience. <laughs> it's, it's it was sometimes hard enough to keep people. It was sometimes hard enough to keep people attuned when they're sitting in the pews 15 feet away from you. And right, now, correct. you know, they, they might be tuning in from 5,000 miles away. Um, you know, so it just to, to establish connection is, is really hard in this day and age. And we just have to work harder. I think, you know, it's not an excuse. We just have to work harder to create it. Well, you mentioned I want to pick up on this because this is something that's fascinating me. And I've talked to a bunch of our colleagues about this. Uh, and and also some congregational leadership. When you said some people are there five thousand miles away, how much of an impact do you think this experience of virtual worship, education, etc., is really going to have on the synagogue, the normal American suburban synagogue, you know, that we all know, uh, as this as we emerge out of this? and buildings open back up and you come to the building for services and the ritual committee meeting and the adult education. How much of this is gonna change, do you think? I mean, I hope it changes a lot. I, I hope it shows us that um, technology need, need not be scary. Um, I hope it shows us that innovation need not be scary. Right? It, it's sad that it took a pandemic in a lot of ways for us to sort of drastically sort of rethink how we pray and how we learn. But in truth, we've probably been due for uh, a sort of very, very close kind of analysis for a long time. Um, I, I don't know if, if, if meetings can't happen over Zoom going forward. You know, I don't know if bar mitzvah tutoring can't happen over Zoom at least sometimes. Um, I, I don't know if it would be so bad that uh, seniors who maybe aren't so ready to, to drive in the winter or in, in the dark um, can't tune in from home over Zoom um, for Friday night services. Um, you know, some of that I think is 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 worth talking about and thinking about it as we get there. Um, you know, the very premise of, of virtual content. It also allows us to engage speakers and teachers from all over the place. We, we've done a whole series um, with an Israeli teacher and friend uh, on a series of Sunday mornings. He did a program with us about Hanukkah. He did a program with us about Tu B'Shvat. And he was sitting in his bedroom outside of Jerusalem. And we were sitting on our computers here in South Jersey. And they were fabulous. Um, so, you know, I think it has, in the most ironic of ways, sort of brought the Jewish world closer, even as we're all confined to our own. You know, we have access to each other in ways we never did. We're talking to each other in ways we never did and, and learning from each other. Um, you know, the CCR convention, which is about to happen, um, we're all going to be sitting in our computer screens, but hearing from rabbis and teachers from all over the world um, in ways that I think are, are, are really, really powerful and, and going to be quite profound. So it's, it's not all bad. And I, I think I hope it opens our eyes to some of the possibilities going forward. I mean, you do mention the adult education, and there are more people who I think now are attending some very, very high quality um, adult education things because they can sit in their living room and tune into the scholar in Jerusalem or Melbourne or Los Angeles or New York, uh, which they never were able to do before. Or even, I mean, e even their own rabbi. I mean, our numbers have been through the roof for adult ed and discussions and we've done discussions of movies and you know once upon a time if we had hold, held such a discussion on a tuesday night in the library you know it maybe it would be great to have 25 30 people there 
it's not uncommon for us to have 70, 80, 100 people right. uh, log on, on on a Tuesday or Wednesday night um, because they're home, because it's easy. Um, you don't have to be totally engaged. You can just listen in ways that you couldn't if you were sitting in the library, right? Everyone sees you there. Everyone knows you're there. You're worried you're going to get called on for something. You can just listen. Um, and I, I think there's something really, really wonderful about that too. Um, and, and then maybe there's a takeaway for us there too. Yeah. I, I think this is the thing that I've been really thinking about and talking to congregations about too. And this is why I wanted to get your take on this, because my sense is that the synagogue that are emerging out of this, that they're going to have to rewire every room so that if I don't want to get in the car, uh, or if I may have something with my kids, but I do want to go to the adult education meeting. And I'm not an older adult, and, but I, I have a conflict, and I want it to be I can zoom in, yeah. Because in the library or room six, whatever, it's wired for electronic communication, and likewise services. Yeah. I mean, I think I think many colleagues are saying the same thing. We're getting more people, uh, and they're getting used to the fact that they can zoom in on a Friday night, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Do you think this will and, also change? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say something quickly. It also changes even within the synagogue. You know, for instance, with our religious school or our preschool, um, you know, there's a reluctance to bring them all into the sanctuary at the same time. So they can stay in their classrooms while I'm standing in the sanctuary and everyone has their screen on and I'm addressing all of these classes and um, we're all in the building together. Um, but they don't have to co-mingle. There's not a hundred kids sitting all together running the risk of, 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 um, of spreading anything, you know, so there's, there's also that I think it's, it's not all sort of all or nothing. You're either in the building or you're not. I think it's allowing us to sort of think about, okay, even when you're in the building, right. you know, can we bring all the fifth and sixth graders together virtually, um, you know, or K one, two together virtually without having 50 kids sitting like in a pile on the Bima. So, um, so I, I think, you know, it goes even further. Yeah. We're going to be talking, uh, in a podcast in April with, um, uh, Rabbi Jan Katsu on really some of the educational implications as we move out of the pandemic about whether mm -hmm. the, the old fashioned, typical suburban, not suburban, supplemental after public school, religious school, a Sunday morning for two and a half, if that really is a viable future or because of the electronic revolution, that's all going to change, which I think it is. Uh, and I'm interested to hear your take on that. You're right. that This opens up a whole different possibility of the way we do religious education for our children. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to also pick your brain a little bit about, as a result of this year, this amazing year, it's been a year, about the sense of isolation uh, that we deal with now with so many people, regardless of age. Um, yeah. There's this um, explosion of mental health concerns across the generations. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some of this in, in your congregation, because I know every colleague we talk to is reporting the same thing. How are you? How do how do you begin to understand this? How do you begin to reach those people? How do you begin to fight that sense of um, spiritual as well as physical isolation, especially the spiritual isolation? Yeah, I, I see it happening on on sort of two ends of the spectrum. I think um, first and foremost, um, at least for me, uh, with regard to our teenagers, um, teenagers who crave social interaction whose lives revolve around their friends um, and um, who are witnessing firsthand all of the, the horror of, of life these days. Um, so, you know, they're not yet old enough where they can process it in a meaningful way. They don't have the life experience. They've maybe never really faced hardship. Maybe they've never faced loss. Maybe they've never faced real disappointment. So they don't have the life experience or, or, or even the tools to really um, sort of process. And yet they have front row seats to all of it because they're on their phone all the time. They see the news. They see the updates. Um, so I think when you, when you put those various factors together, our teens are in a, are in a very hard place. Um, 
And so I know I'm really leaning into mental health and self-care when it comes to our teens. Um, we just had a mental health professional just last week speaking with our confirmation class, um, talking about sort of items you can have sort of in your toolbox as it were, uh, when it comes to anxiety, depression, loneliness. Um, I just wrote a, a bulletin article about the skyrocketing rates of suicide among teens. Um, it's a really very hard time, I think, to be a teen or to be a college student. Um, on the other end of the spectrum are our seniors, right, who were already maybe feeling somewhat isolated and alone. Um, maybe we're living alone, uh, maybe had lost a loved one. And now there is this sort of profound impact of the pandemic. Um, so I know a lot of my work with regard to our seniors is just checking in, calling all the time. Um, making sure Sisterhood and Men's Club is sort of aware of those who need help, making sure our um, we have sort of a chesed committee can can be there to, um, to help those who are in need. Um, of course, the irony of all of this on the other side of it is that in, in an odd way, we're more connected than ever before. Uh, uh, I'm talking to congregants far more frequently than than I than I was a year ago. I mean, especially those first few months of the pandemic, it was not uncommon for me to have 40 conversations a day, plus, you know, 25 text exchanges, just checking in all the time. How are you? Can I get you anything? Can we get you anything? Um, so I, I think that piece, though, has been I mean, that's that's sort of the headline of the pandemic is isolation and how to combat it. What do we do about it as a congregational community? Let me ask you a question because you, you use the word that I've been thinking about a lot lately and have just come up with conversations in workshops and teaching that I'm doing for, for my Jewish sacred agey work. And that is this concept of loss. Um, and whether you've picked up a sense when you're dealing with baby boomers and the generation ahead of us, where time is so precious now, and the sense of loss being, um, as one 86-year-old man exp spoke to me a couple of weeks ago saying, I've, I'm lo I've lost a year of my life at 86. I'll, I can't get that back. If I'm 30 yeah. or if I'm 25 or if I'm that 18-year-old kid in, in your youth group, I'm going to get that back in a way. But if yeah. I'm 86, you know, have we, do we need to redefine what it means to deal with this concept of loss now as a result of this? Yeah. I, well, I, I would never diminish anyone's sort of sense of loss. I think, you know, we have kids who are uh, sort of grieving even, you know, the fact of a lost sports season. You know, maybe you prepared your entire life to be a, you know, a varsity senior on the basketball team. And all of a sudden that was swiped away from you. There's disappointment there. Right. Um, for them, there's disappointment, and and I wouldn't diminish that. Um, and then there's loss that is, you know, capital L loss, loss of life. Um, I think in a lot of ways we're all grieving. You know, I think our our kids were profoundly impacted by a summer that disappeared, um, oh, by camp that definitely. didn't happen, um, and we shouldn't diminish that. You know, what it what it meant to sort of have this sort of gaping hole. In, in, in their own sort of timeline. Um, and to sort of, sort of acknowledge the fact that we're all, you know, we're all walking around in some ways bereaved right now. Everyone has lost something. Absolutely. Um, we've all lost something. And so many of us have lost someone. Um, and so, you know, there's, as a Jewish community, as a nation, there's, there's very little that sort of connects us um, you know, there's so much difference. That's part of the beauty of, of, of what it means to be here. But um, I think one of the things that sort of binds us together right now is loss, um, disappointment, loss, sadness. Um, and I know we as a congregation have, have tried to be really cognizant of that during worship. Um, I'm in the process of um, spearheading a community-wide COVID memorial. Um, which will bring together all the synagogues of our area to sort of acknowledge that loss, because I think there's a temptation, you know, given our sort of American psyche 
to pretend everything's fine, I'm fine, I'm tough, I can deal with it, I'm not affected. When in truth, deep down inside, I think we've all been profoundly affected. Yeah, I, I think one of the images that will come out of this, especially when we get to that Torah portion next year, or next fall, is the, the Jacob to coming Israel thing and the wounding. You know, I, I, there is this psychic spiritual wound that uh, has been inflicted upon all of us, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Um, yes. And I, and I think, you know, I, I, could, I could see many congregations, not even, not only on the high holidays, but really ritualizing this, as you say, acknowledging that, talking about it, um, and bringing it forward, and, and basically saying, let us as a community, a faith community, embrace this, and we're, all, we're going to be okay. We can't recapture it, but we can, in Jewish terms, we can use it, what was and what happened yeah. to us, and move forward. So I think, you know, what yeah. you're doing with the, with the community at recognition and um, and I always yeah. like to look at where texts could approach us, which is why we'll right. go back, go back to where we started as we end where we started um, yeah. on that image well, of think, the Seder. Yeah, go ahead. I go think ahead. Um, just, just to touch on that quickly, I mean, I think we as Jews, we're really good at sort of codifying and sort of canonizing loss. Right. So, you know, in many synagogues, obviously. You know, you'll find uh, a memorial to those who, who perished in the Holocaust. Maybe you'll find a memorial to fallen is Israeli soldiers. Maybe you'll find a memorial related to 9-11, right? So I think it will be important for us to sort of treat this sort of chapter in our existence as profound and significant. Um, and whether it's a date that we return to every year, um, it, or, or it's a memorial service that we hold every year, a, a physical space we set up in the synagogue. Um, I, I think it will be important to sort of mark the loss and acknowledge the loss and ritualize our sort of uh, bereavement um, in hopefully ways that are impactful and, um, and appropriate. Ben, Rabbi Ben David, the senior rabbi of Adam Emanuel in beautiful bucolic Mount Laurel, New Jersey. I know it very well. Um, ben, thank you very much. I, I really do appreciate your time and your insights as always right on. Uh, say hello to the family um, and uh, take care of yourself and stay healthy. Stay healthy and stay well and stay safe, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Anytime. Our pleasure. You take care. To all of you, I want to thank you again for joining us on today's edition of Secrets of Meeting, uh, the TV show and podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. And remember, uh, you can follow us on our website, the JewishSacredAging.com, as well as now, thanks to our producer, the Roku Broadcast System, whatever that is. Um, I'll ask my grandchildren, they, they know what it is. Anyway, we welcome your comments and suggestions uh, to me, Rabbi Address at JewishSacredAging.com. We invite you again to visit our Jewish Sacred Aging Facebook page. And if you'd like to make a tax-free donation to help us continue the work of Jewish Sacred Aging and especially these podcasts, please go to the homepage of our website and click on the Donate button. Seekers of Meaning is produced at the Broadcast Center of Lubetkin Media Companies in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And a big shout out and thank you to our producer, Steve Lubetkin. Again, I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. I look forward to greeting you again on our next Seekers of Meaning podcast and TV show. To all of you, shalom, stay safe, stay healthy. Goodbye. Goodbye.